Let us feel the powerful presence of the Lord. Let us feel that He is around. He is speaking to us. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here together once again. We surrender to you the second day of our inner healing retreat. Lord, we beg you to take complete control of our life. Forgive all our weaknesses and our repeated failures. Lord, we declare that we are nothing without you. We are nothing before you. Jesus, you said you can do nothing apart from me. Lord, we declare it. We believe it. Let's, let's kindly repeat together wherever you are in silence, keeping your microphone off. You can just repeat 10 times. My Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. 10 times together. My Jesus, I can do nothing without nothing you. My you. Jesus, I can do nothing <laughs> apart from you. My Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. Apart. My Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. My Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. My Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. My Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. My Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. My Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. My Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. My Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. Lord Jesus, we know very well that we cannot do anything, we cannot achieve anything, we cannot receive healing with our own hard work or effort. We need you, Lord. We have come for this inner healing retreat so that we may receive healing from you. Lord, we know we cannot heal ourselves. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us and anoint us. Give us a new heart. Let us uh, read this word of God. This is from Prophet Ezekiel chapter 36, verses from 24. The word of God says, I will take you from the nations. I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then we continue to read verse 25. Verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. Let us keep, let us look uh, uh, intently to this word. See, this is an action of God. We cannot clean ourselves. He has to clean us. We cannot remove the painful scars from our memory. The Lord has to do it, and he is willing to do that. That's why he is telling, I will sprinkle clean water. Clean water is the symbol of the most Holy Spirit. He is going to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Then you will be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols. What are these idols? It can be money, people, power, position, name, fame, any of the material things whom you rely on, any of the humans that you depend on. And God is going to cleanse you from all such idols and he is going to cleanse us. And we continue to read. Now this is verse 26. The most important. A new heart I will give you. He's promising. A new heart I will give you. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He's assuring you he will give us a new heart. And he's telling us a new spirit he will put within us. And he will remove from our body a heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Believe it, it is possible. That's why he has gathered us together here on this day to give us a new heart. We read God gave a new heart to King Saul and made him the, the king of Israel. The Lord gave uh, David a new heart and made him the king and the prophet of Israel. The Lord gave a new heart to the, pre to the prophets whom he chose. They were ordinary people. But when they received a new heart and a new spirit, they became the servants of God. And it is possible. He can remove from our body a heart of stone. He has removed a heart of stone from Saul, Paul, who, had, uh, who was a persecutor. 1 Timothy 1 from 13 we read, who was Paul and what happened to him? The, the same thing can happen to us. Saint Paul is confessing who he was. I was a, a formerly a blasphemer, a man of violence, and I have defected from the Lord. But the Lord has shown his mercy upon me. So this is the same thing that is going to happen. Let us repeat this word of God from wherever you are. Just read this word. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, but I have received mercy because I, I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Remember, who was Paul? Then only you will understand how can our God keep his promises. 
that he promised in the book of Ezekiel that he himself will cleanse us, he himself will remove the heart of stone and will put within us a heart of flesh. And now we come to the New Testament and we look at the life of a person called Saul who became Paul. Exactly what the Lord has promised came true practically in the life of a man. And Saint Paul confesses what was his identity, who was he? I was, he is putting about himself, I was formerly a blasphemer. See, as you listen to me today, some of you have blasphemed. Maybe in your young days, you have questioned God, his existence. You made fun of priests, you made fun of nuns, you have you made fun of God, you've made fun of uh, faith, going to church, you were, you were a blasphemer. And now, and a persecutor, he, see, this was the same with the Saint Paul. He was a persecutor and a man of violence. He, he took part in killing Stephen. He supported it and he persecuted the Christians. See, he broke, it seems that he broke all the Ten Commandments. However, Saint Paul received mercy because he had acted ignorantly and we continue to read now verse 14. This is what Saint Paul says. So the same miracle can happen and the grace of our Lord Jesus overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. See the grace that is the self-giving of God. That is the pure act of God. Grace is a pure divine act. It's not an act of human. It's the divine act in us. Grace, the indwelling presence of God in us is called grace. So it comes from above. Then we read verse 15 and St. Paul underlines one important truth of the Holy Scripture. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. The saying, if there is a saying that is sure and that is worthy of full acceptance of the entire Bible, of the entire Christian faith, there is a statement that is fully true and fully acceptable that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Sisters and brothers, as you listen to me today, smile please. We, you have a great good news. This good news is that Christ Jesus came for you. Are you a sinner? Are you depressed? Are you fearful? Are you sorrowful? Are you going through a lot of agony in your life? Do you feel that you have committed all the sins and broke all ten commandments and you are part of committing sins? Even cardinal sins. Sisters and brothers, you have hope because Christ Jesus came into this world for you. So as we come together for this inner healing, it is possible because God can give you a new heart. God gave this new heart to Paul who was a blasphemer, a persecutor and a man of violence. Then how much more he can give you a new heart. King David knew this. That's why after offending God, committing murder, adultery and even involving in idolatry, saying King David prayed. This is Psalm chapter 51 verses 10 and 11. What is the importance of this prayer? He is praying. He knew that he, need, he needs a clean heart and he cannot clean his own heart. So he is asking God, create in me a clean heart of God. So this is what you have to put into your mind, into your heart. You cannot create a heart for yourself, a new heart, a new life. Your Lord Jesus can do. That is why he prayed, create in me a clean heart of God and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. See, this is what he has prayed, create in me a clean heart. So this is what the same that we are asking God to do in us. Psalm 51 verse 10. So this is what we are asking God through this inner healing retreat. Lord, it's easy and it's possible for you to create in me a clean heart, a new heart. I do have a testimony. It's from my own life. It takes 12 years to become a priest. So when we joined the seminary, we were 28 of us joined the minor seminary. But when it became becoming priest, only 12 of us. Uh, out of 28, only 12 of us became priests because the formation to become priest take 12 years. So along the way, many left and 12 of us remained and we became priests, 12 of us. And now after we became priests, we were scattered into different parts of the world, 12 of us in different, even working in different continents. So, and now I'm a priest now for more than 14 years, I'm a priest, 14 years I'm a priest now. Uh, so uh, not 14, 17 years, I'm a priest for now for 17 years. So it's actually after 10 years, it is after 10 years, I met one of my classmates, a priest who was with me because after I became a priest, I was in Mumbai, in Thabo, then I was, I left for Kenya in Africa. I worked there for eight years continuously. Then uh, in between we had a priest retreat. So I came to attend a retreat for the priest that is in our general aid. So one of my classmates was also attending this, that retreat and we were sharing the same room because we had no enough rooms. We were 60 priests attending that annual retreat for that year. So during the time of the retreat, we were sharing the same room and we were attending the retreat. So after three, four days, my best friend, he was also my friend in the seminary. We were studying together 
And uh, my priest friend, he told me, Anthony, you are not the same. You have changed a lot. I just joined my hands and I thank, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much because you have changed me. He made a positive comment on me. He said, Anthony, you're not the same because he knows all my weaknesses. From the minor seminary, almost 12 years we were together. We studied together, we moved together, we talked together. So he knows the language that I use, he knows the comments I made, he knows me by heart, what is inside, what's outside, for more than 12 years he knew me. And now after 10 years, after a break of 10 years of priesthood, that's the time because I was in Africa, we are not able to see, I could see him after 10 years, and by that time he's telling, I am changed, and I attribute that change to Jesus, and I know as I speak to you, it is possible for a human to change. If anybody is putting in your mind that this person cannot change, my husband can never change, my wife can never change, my brother, my in-law, my mother-in-law, my daughter-in-law, my siblings, my in-laws cannot change. We will change Mark chapter 10 verse 27 we read, Gospel of Mark chapter 10 verse 27, Jesus categorically told the, the apostles for mortals when they were doubting how all these things can happen. Gospel of Mark chapter 10 verse 27, Jesus said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. It's impossible for more for human beings, but not for God. For God, it is easy to change human beings. God can change anyone. Again, Prophet Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27. I am the Lord of all hosts. I am the Lord of all creation. Is there anything impossible for me? Is there anything too hard for me? God is asking. So for God, it is possible. Again, in the book of Jeremiah, we read chapter 13 verse 23, where uh, Prophet Jeremiah is, is making this important statement. Can the Ethiopians change the color of their skin? Can they change the color of their skin or the leopards? This is Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 23. Can Ethiopians change their skin or leopards their spots? Then also you can do good uh, who are accustomed to do evil. Even if you are accustomed to do evil, God is able to make you to do right. Can the Ethiopians change the color of their skin? Can you change the color of their skin? You know, those who are aware, they, so they know that plastic surgery can make it, make it changing. You know, those are only just skin deep things. But God can change a personality. God can change the nature of a person. Look at the apostles. Who were they? Men of fear. They were afraid of anything and everything. And out of the fear of the people, let us read Gospel of John chapter 20 from 19. Let us read this word of God. Let us uh, look at the screen and the word of God will be displayed. This is John chapter 20 from 19 we read. When it was evening, on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. See, these disciples were afraid. They were afraid of the Jewish people. They were afraid of the Pharisees, the high priests. They had fear. See, and these people who had this fear, now we read the same same disciples after they were being led and filled by the holy spirit the same people had no fear at all they were preaching more and more now let us read and so the apostles chapter 4 verse 11 we read that this this jesus is the stone that was rejected by you see the people who are talking so much against uh, against this they are saying this Jesus is the stone by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. To whom they are preaching? To the people who made them fear. The people whom they were afraid once upon a time. Looking at them directly on their face, they are commanding. With commanding voice, they say, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. And then we continue to read verse 12. What do they preach? There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Sisters and brothers, and we continue to read verse 13. They are categorically declaring the truth to the same people who made them fear. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. Now they saw the boldness, see the same people, Peter and John were afraid and were shutting themselves inside the room. And now these same people came out of the room and shouting about Jesus and his power. From where they got this boldness, the Holy Spirit gave them. And why it happened? Because the Holy Spirit gave them a new heart. 
That's why they were not afraid. So as you listen to me today, believe that it's possible for you to receive inner healing. It's possible for you to become a new person. It's possible for you to get out of that fear that is dominating your life. The fear of people, fear of your husband, fear of your job, fear of your employers, fear of your dad, fear of your mother, fear of your in-laws, fear of your society, fear of your community, fear of speaking in public, fear of preaching the word of God, fear of even singing the songs though you have a beautiful voice, fear of playing the keyboard, fear of doing anything. Sisters and brothers, God can change you as he can give you a new heart. This is the meaning and the purpose of inner healing because we all are in one way or the other way are wounded. Maybe with the fear. See, there are different types of inner wounds. Even Sister Hazel was preaching about different areas like that of rejection, pain, sorrow and impurity complexes and the problems that happens from the very moment of our conception. If our parents were not being prepared, if they were not sacramentally wedded, what are the impacts that the little baby fetus can have? And even after the child is being born, how it is being affected. See, inner wounds are a practical reality. We are all wounded. But we have to know deep inside there is someone who is able to heal us. Hebrews chapter 4 from 15 we read, who is Jesus and what does he do? Can he feel our pain? Can he know that what we are going through? The scripture says that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. See, this is the assurance our Lord Jesus is giving us that he knows our weaknesses. He, in every respect, he was tested without sin. So that we are not talking something that uh, to Jesus who is a stranger to our problems. He knows as St. John Paul II says, Jesus had hands like us, legs like us, heart like us, eyes like us, ears like us. He was a fully human. So he can feel whatever pain you are going through and he can transform us. Then again, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18 we read, he can, he knows the pain, the sorrow that we are going through and he can make us a new creation. That's why it's important to know that our inner wounds are to be submitted to God because he himself was tested by what he suffered. He's able to help those who are being tested. So as you listen to this, there is no one, no science, no technology, no medicine, no doctor, no advice, no counselor can help us to become a new person, to feel our pain the way we feel the pain. Because Jesus Christ alone said, Jesus Christ alone said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. John chapter 14 verse 6. There is no one in the history of the world claimed this identity that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And not only that, there is no one in the history of the humanity said that this command means this is written about Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. There is no one. That means if there is someone who can heal your pain because that pain is rooted in a past painful memory, in a past painful incident. And only somebody who knows that past painful incident can set you free from that problem. That's the way you can get out of this wound. That's the way you can get inner healing. That means inner healing is possible only through Jesus Christ. There is no one who can heal us. And everything else is a skin deep treatment. Unless we come to Jesus, come to the Lord. And then he will do something new. Come to him. That's why it's only Jesus who said. This is Matthew chapter 11 from 28. Jesus said. Come to me, you who are weary and tired, and I will give you rest. Come to me with your weaknesses, with your problems, with your fear, with your depression, with your feelings of committing suicide, with your feelings that you're unwanted, you, you have been born out of wedlock, that you feel desperate. There is someone who is inviting you, Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, come to me, you who are weary and downtrodden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And he's inviting us to receive this healing. And it is possible through Jesus. Let's repeat this word of God wherever you are. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And this is possible when you come to the Lord. I do remember uh, a particular uh, child, a son. He had this problem of sweating all over his body. It comes when it comes to writing exams. When something serious happens, he has to face some superiors or people, his hand will start shivering and he will sweat all over his body. And even his examination purpose were wet, he said, because of this problem. And it's rooted in fear, he knew. It's a kind of a fear, a panic attack that happens. So when we started to pray for him, he was brought for a retreat. And during the time of the retreat, we came to know this problem of fear is rooted. This problem is rooted in his relationship with his dad. 
he had fear of his dad he had shame over his dad and he had unforgiveness to his dad it all been connected in sweating so that's why even the psychologists after thorough study they made a statement what our mind hides our body will bring it out what our mind hides the body will bring it out actually he was hiding his hatred towards his dad because his dad was a drunkard he used to abuse the son so one day he was in the school talking with his friends then his father came fully drunk and when he came and he came to abuse his son in front of his friends his friends and he fell down and it was a and he even lost his control his dad so his friends laughed at him publicly and he also felt unconscious it was a shame for him this misbehavior of his dad put shame in him hatred towards his father so when somebody comes publicly when he was to face someone he wanted to withdraw he also started to develop something called being introvert that he had this shame he came to him and that's the time that is why since that hatred was in him his body started to react when something important happens he's afraid what will happen and it also created undue anxiety in him, undue anxiety. And he was ashamed of his father, sisters and brothers. And during the inner healing, we told him to forgive his dad. We invited Jesus into the past painful memory. And he was brought and he himself confessed how he got the healing. So when he was praying that the time that his father was, he, he just brought to mind that same incident that happened. He was talking to his friends and his father appeared all of a sudden from nowhere, being drunk, unable to stand on his two feet. And he's talking some abusive words and his friends are laughing. He just brought that incident into his mind. And immediately the Holy Spirit reminded him of Jesus being condemned to death. Jesus is standing in front of the same, same people whom he helped, whom he healed, whom he gave bread whom he multiplied the bread and, and fed them. And these are the same people shouting and screaming, spitting on his, on his face and abusing him, calling his name and ashaming him. But Jesus is keeping quiet and he's forgiving them. And he heard that prayer of Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. This boy, he was put into that same situation. See, he was thinking, if it was a stranger or somebody who is not known to me, do abuse me, I could bear that. But my own dad, in front of my friends, how can he behave like that? So the more he was thinking, the more he was unable to forgive and more the hatred was. Then that's the time the Lord reproduced that same incident and told this boy, my son, I know the pain you had. I myself had gone through it and I beg you, forgive your dad. The same way I forgave, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, and they cast lots to divide his clothing. See, that they did not put any value for Jesus. They have just ashamed him and he forgave. That same moment, this boy forgave. And after this forgiveness, and he also decided to go and ask the dad to forgive him for, to, uh, forgive him for keeping hatred, and ask the dad to bless him. And the father actually was ignorant. He was under alcohol. He did not know what he was doing. He was blind. So this is what the Lord Jesus reminded him. So when he asked forgiveness to his dad and the dad blessed him, since then he had no problem of shivering, sweating or any problem. He overcame that. Because sisters and brothers, when we deal about inner healing, we have to know the root cause. In what That which is manifesting may not be the same root cause. It's like the coronavirus. You know, this COVID-19, it manifests in different people in different ways. See, is for some people, it is stomach pain. For some, they lose the taste. For some, they have back pain. For some, they have loose motion. For some, they have headache. For some, they, have, they cannot get sleep. Some, they feel like vomiting. Different manifestations. Sometimes people think that it's not COVID, but because they have fever. So they think it's just a fever. Some have cough, some have cold. But it's only when we check the root, we come to know they are already infected with COVID. So some delayed their treatment because they were just thinking it is just a, a cold, but eventually it becomes serious. So this is somewhat the same for COVID. It is a somewhat the same for inner wounds. So the more you keep it, the more it is dangerous, it is contagious, it is harmful. While I was in uh, Africa, I visited Tanzania. Then uh, while giving a retreat, I had a severe cold. So I told the father who is in charge there in Tanzania, I told him to just uh, help me uh, uh, to have a, a medicine for cold. So I told him just to give me a, a medicine uh, for cold. Uh, then he told me, father, 
you cannot just have this medicine first you have to check malaria i told him but it's just a call he said no for the safer side let us first check up uh, malaria then you can have the medicine then because the father insisted and he told but if you take a medicine for cold then if you check for malaria you will not find it and it can be more dangerous so you have to first check for malaria and if it's not malaria you can have this medicine so i went and checked with this priest then i found malaria in my body then he was so happy he told me father you are now baptized in africa i told him what kind of baptism is this he said baptism with malaria so anyone who comes to africa should be baptized with this malaria and the goodness is that once you are infected with malaria that is always there in your blood it will not go it will make an indelible mark in your body anyway i said thank you jesus praise you jesus anyway i have to just be baptized means to be identified with the pain that the people have see when you god can permit certain uh, struggles to happen certain uh, struggles it is to identify that pain that means you don't want to be afraid of the wounds that you have because you have jesus who has already been wounded like you so this boy was being healed when he came to know his lord and god jesus suffered the same way so when he submitted his sorrow into the hands of jesus he received this healing he was being set free so in, in any area of inner wounds it can be fear and one of the the, the major wound that is paralyzing people is that of fear even fear of people proverbs chapter 29 verse 26 that the fear of people lays a snare so if anybody fear people and this fear can paralyze them many are not aware of it and they don't deal with it see for the, the with inner wounds we cannot hide the inner wounds so if we hide the wounds it will harm us it will harm and that is why it's important that we submit the area of fear into the hands of god the fear of others this is proverbs 29 25 proverbs 29 25 the fear of others lays a snare but one who trusts in the lord is secure one who is trust in the lord are secure so those who are fear those who fear others the fear of others lays a snare it is a snare so if you are afraid of anything or anyone it is a snare but one who trusts in the lord is secure so if you look into the root cause of many problems many behavioral problems many kind of difficulties what it is rooted is rooted in fear somebody said uh, for a kind of a, a definition for fear and they were saying that fear means false evidence appearing real f e a r false evidence appearing real they are false but it appears to be real that means people are afraid of superiors afraid of their parents afraid of somebody and it goes on it's even a child who has fear of father he can fear all those who are in authority a child who has fear of the mother can have problem in relationships see if a child is being afraid of the mother that child when when that child gets married can have fear of in-laws mother-in-law and all those so if we just take fear oh it's simple it's okay it is as it is a seed that satan is sowing to paralyze us in to block doing good because inner wounds have three major problems the first problem it will block us in doing good this is what saint paul teaches in romans chapter 7 from 15 that i do the very thing that i hate so if i do the things that i hate that means i see a principle of evil in me and this is the inner wound that means it will block us to do good and the second problem of inner wound it will lead us to sin see if you have if you keep the wound of hatred it can lead you to sin sin of murder see uh, Cain hated Abel and it it created in him the spirit of murder. See, any kind of inner wound, that of inner wound, that of hatred, unforgiveness, uh, even that of alcoholism, any kind of things that we develop and we don't deal with it, it can lead you to sin. Even fear. Fear can make you to commit sin. It will block us to do good. And the second thing, it will lead us to sin. And the third thing, it will create bad habits. It will make us into bondage. It will lead us to bondage. For example, some people, they have been addicted to sex, addicted to pornography, addicted to filthy things, addicted to, some are addicted to alcohol, some are addicted to gambling, some are addicted to playing cards or certain involvement in games, some are addicted to certain wrong relationships, spirit of adultery, and they are struggling to come out of it. They stop for a few days, few months, but again, it is coming back to them because the root cause is rooted in a in an inner wound maybe the wound of being sexually abused maybe the wound of being afraid maybe the wound of having lost somebody in the family whom to whom they were so much attached that's why we need to we don't want to hide our inner wounds 
We have to bring our wounds to the Lord who is the healer and he is ready to heal you the way you are without being ashamed or afraid. See, who was Zacchaeus? He was a public sinner, an outcast. People did not like him. And he was even physically, he had a lot of inferiority complex. Even in the case of society, he had a complex because the society did not appreciate him because he was a tax collector. They, did, they hated him. So physically, spiritually, emotionally, Zacchaeus was an wounded person. But how he was healed? Luke chapter 19 from 10 we read. Luke 19 from 9 let us read. Luke 19 from 9. When Jesus came to him. See the initiative comes from Jesus. He comes to him. He enters into his home. And the, in the very presence of Jesus Christ, he got converted. See the person who loved money. See who is a tax collector, the lover of money. He who had a lot of money and he was into that. This is Luke chapter, uh, not so 18, but 19. 19 from 8. 19 from 8 up to 10 we read, 8 up to 10. So what is the, the same thing that he valued? In the presence of Jesus, he is giving up everything. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Nobody told him. See, for a rich man, can a rich man be converted? Jesus himself said, it is too hard for a rich man to enter heaven. And at the same time, Jesus himself is proving in his presence, a rich man like Zacchaeus got completely converted. See, now he has become bankrupt. See, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Four times. See, the half of his property, he is already willing to give to the poor. Then four times as much he was defrauded. That means now he is going to become a beggar. And how he got this transformation? In the presence of Jesus. Jesus transformed him. And he became a profound personality. Now he's not afraid of being ashamed by people because he got the greatest treasure, that of Jesus. So you can be a new person, you can get a new heart through Jesus in his presence. And Zacchaeus got that inner healing. See, what was his wound? He loved money. Can love of money can be an inner wound? 1 Timothy chapter 6 from 9, we read that love of money is the root of all evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, they have wandered away from sin and have pierced themselves with many people. And then now he is in the presence of Jesus. Now he gets converted. And now he has given up the same thing that has made him a captive. That he has given up of the love of money as he submits himself to the Lord. Sisters and brothers, whatever may be the pain, the sorrow, the fear that you have, you know, why love of money that you are afraid of being rejected by people? People have insecurity feeling. There are people who think that if I have money, if, because I don't have enough money, I'm suffering. But the money can trap us in many things. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And verse 10 we read, because verse 10, the same chapter, verse 10, 1 Timothy 6, 10, because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the pain and pierced themselves with many pains. So now as you listen to me, many of us have broken. That's why we work for pain and night. Some people do extra work, why they need more money. But is this money is solving our problem? It increases our problem. It makes us to be wounded more and more. One person, he told me from UK, he used to help people back at home. The more he helped, the more they wounded him. The more they rejected, the, the more they made fun. So they say that you gave more to my sister, you did not give me enough, you gave a property to them, you did not give me anything. Though they helped everyone, you cannot solve problem with money. You can only solve problem with Jesus. The love of money is the root of all kinds of people. Now, this is an inner wound. If you have love of money, that means you put your trust not in God, but in money and material things. That's why Jesus categorically said, this is Luke 12, 15. A person's life does not come to fulfillment in the amount of the riches that he has. And he said to them, take care, Luke 12, 15. And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. If it was consisting in the abundance of possessions, Zacchaeus must be the most contented person. Why Zacchaeus was still wounded, feeling inferiority complex? Why he was feeling he was inadequate, insignificant? Money cannot give us healing or fullness. That's why Jesus said, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Many are still wounded, feeling empty because they have not received the greatest wealth, the treasure that is Jesus himself. Jesus himself. 
and he is he gives you healing see the the inner healing Zacchaeus received is in the very presence of Jesus Jesus came in he received healing and what is the sign of that healing the very thing that he put priority in his life that is money he now he does not like it this is what let us read this powerful scripture from the book of Psalm 39 verse 11 the scripture says you chastise mortals in punishment for sin consuming like a moth what is dear to them surely everyone is a mere breath see the scripture says let's look into this word you chastise mortals in punishment for sin see the lord chastised Zacchaeus in punishment for his greed consuming like a moth what is dear to them see consuming wealth that was consuming wealth as just moth what is near to them surely everyone is a mere breath see the same thing that he loved the most he considered it as nothing for Zacchaeus, why he was wounded? The more he loved money, the more he collected money. The more he loved money, money hurt him. Made him to commit sin, go away from God, feel more and more wounded, hurt, rejected by people. Now when the Lord chastised him, touched him, healed him, God himself came to him. He got converted, not only that, he hated the same sin he was doing the most. So this is inner healing. So when Jesus comes into you, that same passion, that same uncontrollable desire you have for sex, it will come, it will, you will get out of it, and then you will be filled with the love of God. You will become a new person. It's possible. If there is someone who is in the bondage of alcohol, and you consume alcohol, and you feel you cannot have sleep, you cannot do anything if you don't drink alcohol. Remember, this is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, I heard an interpretation from an anointed preacher. He was telling in this way: Why Holy Spirit is being compared to those who drink alcohol? See, you do not get drunk with alcohol. Ephesians chapter five verse eighteen. See, those who get drunk with alcohol, they behave. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. That means those who drink alcohol, you know, they get some kind of sensory pleasures. They get some kind of feeling that they forget their past. There are people who get drunk. They do strange things. They speak in a strange way. You know, they behave in a funny way, in a strange, different way. And it is debauchery. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. That means what? You will do more strange things. That means divine things. Huge things of miracle. Once you are filled with the Holy Spirit. See, if you just get drunk with alcohol, and you just get, just get, some people say, they get uh, fit. You will get more fit spiritually if you are take Holy Spirit inside you. Will, you will not feel that emptiness in your life. He will take possession of your life. Sisters and brothers, inner healing is needed. It's possible. Jesus has done it in the life of a process, in the life of Saint Paul, in the life of Zacchaeus. It has happened and it makes them a new person. It's possible for us to receive whatever may be the wounds that we have. There are people who think about committing suicide. See, don't think that you're the only person you had this problem. We read even in the book of uh, uh, two kings uh, where uh, it is it is not two kings one king chapter 19 this is the life of elijah the mighty prophet the most see the, the entire old testament is being put into law and prophets if moses is representing the law the entire prophecy is being represented in one single prophet called elijah but his agony this is uh, one kings chapter 19 from one we read that just because jezebel the wife of ahab threatened Elijah, a woman, an ordinary, actually the queen, the woman, threatened Elijah. He got frightened. He's thinking of committing suicide. He gets depressed and he has been running 40 days. Such a mighty prophet Elijah had such huge crisis just because a single person threatened him. What about you and me? It is the Bible that says Elijah such a powerful prophet had such feelings of depression, sorrow, fear, anxiety, tension, worry, stress. See, those days there was no much scientific in in investigation. Otherwise, we can even feel there could be blood pressure, high blood pressure for Elijah. High diabetes for Elijah. Maybe all kinds of sicknesses that we have. Some people have strange sicknesses. And most of these sicknesses are caused by stress. And where this stress is, is rooted in fear, in lack of trust. And we look at this, but God did not uh, abandon Elijah. 
He was expecting God in huge things, in earthquake, in strong wind. But at the end, he could feel a cool breeze, and the presence, the gentle presence of the Holy Spirit that transformed King Elijah, a new person, a new personality. The, the prophet Elijah, a new person, a new personality. Today, the Lord is inviting us. Healing from, healing from hatred and unforgiveness, healing from that of sorrow, healing from that of greed, healing, healing from that of the, the, the wounds that is uh, attacking us, different type of wounds. It's possible. For God, it is possible. Surrender and submit to yourself. All your wounds at the feet of the Lord. He's there to heal us. He is there to make us a new person in your relationship. In your relationship with your husband, he can be a new person. In your relationship with your wife, she can be a new person, wherever she is. Most of the time, people wound others because they are wounded. They are wounded. That's why one day, a, a, a husband, a, a woman came to me and she told me, a lady, a married wife, she told me, Father, my husband is a drunk guard. He never takes care of me and my children. He's a selfish person. He only looks after himself. Even he has never asked me, have you eaten? But he needs food. He never takes care of his children. Like he never asks whether my children is studying, going to school. He's totally irresponsible. And whenever I say something, he will say he never got the love of a mother because his mother lost and his father married to somebody else. He had some kind of rejection feelings. His, uh, his stepmother mistreated him. So that's what she said, Father, but how can I solve this problem? I cannot be his mother. I cannot be his father. I can only be a wife. And with all these things, he is he's giving me more and more burden. Now it seems that, Father, I have five children. But including my wife, my husband, I have six children because my husband is always behaves like a little child. And I don't know how to solve this problem. We told her, don't worry, Christ can solve this problem. Jesus can. And we gave her this prayer from Tobit chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 17. Tobit 8, 17, the second part of this prayer. I asked him, what's the name of your husband? She, she explained to me her husband's name is Lawrence. So we told her to pray Tobit 8, 17, the second part like this. Claim this for the, for the husband. This is, be merciful to Lawrence, oh Jesus master. Keep him safe bring his life to fulfillment in happiness and mercy. I told her to take the rosary in her hand and count it 50 times every day. That means why your husband is hurting you? Because his life did not come to fulfillment. He has insecurity feeling. He has not received mercy and happiness from the Lord. So as a wife, when you pray over your husband, pray for your husband, he will be healed of inner wounds. Why he is, he is he's wounding you, he's hurting you? Because he's empty, he's wounded. Be merciful to my husband, Lawrence, O oh, Jesus, Master. O oh, Master, keep him safe. Keep my husband's life safe. He's feeling insecurity, feeling. Bring his life to fulfillment in happiness and mercy. Tobit chapter 17, uh, Tobit chapter 8, verse 17. Claim it. And she claimed, and eventually the husband got completely recovered from this spirit of wounding her wife. Spirit of rejection, spirit of feeling, I'm unloved. Psalm 27, 10. Even if your father or mother forsake you, I will not forsake you, the Lord is telling. You choosing here, you have chosen me, here I am. Sisters and brothers, let us praise and worship the Lord for a moment. Then the song will be displayed and we'll play a song where it says, God has chosen me. And can you say that here I am? That the Lord is present. The Lord is present. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Believe it. Believe it. He's around. He's alive. He's looking after you. Once he comes into you, the same, same sin that is attached to your flesh, you will start hating it. You will reject it. You will renounce it once he chastises you. Lord, I invite you to come into my life because you have chosen me. Lord, here I am. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us feel God present. Somebody who has a very in God is here from this Somebody an accident and got paralyzed the left side of your body. You are totally bedridden. God is strengthening you to, to, to wake you up, to heal you completely from being paralyzed on the left side of your body. Somebody having severe chest pain, God is healing you. Somebody having an infection on your lungs, God is healing you. Somebody who is seriously sick, admitted in the ICU with even with the COVID and pneumonia, God is healing this person. God is touching and healing Rajesh. God is blessing Charlotte. God is blessing you, Veronica. God is blessing Anu. God is strengthening Evelyn. And, and helping her. God is blessing Maria. God is telling her, I know you. I'm standing beside you. Perpetua, God is blessing you. God knows that you're single, but God is telling, I am your husband. I'm there for you. Somebody you have severe back pain. 
God is healing you. Somebody having disc prolapse, God is healing you. Somebody having pain on the lymph nodes, God is healing you. Somebody having urinary infection, God is healing you. Somebody having walking difficulty, God is healing you. Somebody who is listening to this session, keeping your leg up because it has inflammation, you have swelling, you have pain to keep your leg down, God is healing you from this problem. Somebody having knee surgery and you are afraid of surgery, God is healing you. Somebody having fibroids and you are just got married, you don't know whether you can have a baby with all these complications, God is healing you. Alfonso, God is calling you by name. Bakita, God is healing you, God is blessing you. Alex, God is blessing you. Charlie, God is blessing you. Marlene, God is blessing you. Appu, God is blessing you. Sylvester, God is blessing you. Irene, God is blessing you. Jasmine, God is blessing you. God is intervening in the life of Jacinda. All your problem with your husband, God is going to solve it. God is assuring you. Somebody, you just bought a vehicle and on the first day itself, you are driving it met with, with the accident. You are so much afraid whether it was God's plan or not. God is just telling you, don't be afraid. And somebody, you are going for a ministry and on the way that you got met with an accident, then you are feeling afraid. God is telling, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm support. I am supporting you. Let us now continue to listen to Sister Hazel. Let us for a moment pray over her. Lord Jesus, mightily anoint Sister Hazel. Every word that she speaks be anointed. Let the Holy Spirit be poured out upon the people as they listen to Sister Hazel. Let she be anointed. Mother Mary, pray for her. Let's pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and year of our death. Amen. Let's kindly listen to Sister Hazel now. As we go deeper into inner healing, uh, if you have your Bibles, they're open to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Now, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea and, parted, and departed again to Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sica, near the field that God, Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and so Jesus, weary as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. They came a woman from Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where did you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and he whom you now have is not your husband. This you said truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe the hour is coming, when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. We go further down to verse 28. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the city and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the city and were coming to him. This is the word of the Lord. I can imagine, I can picture the whole scene, Jesus walking with his disciples. And they're saying, Master, wait a moment. You are going towards Samaria and that's no place for you because you know the Samaritans were called filthy dogs. And so, Jesus, this could be bad for your reputation. Why are you going there? Don't go, Jesus. Don't go. Can you imagine what the heart of Jesus must have felt? Because he had come for sinners. And uh, wait a minute. Let me continue. I have to go there because there's one woman by the well of Jacob who needs me, and I have to go. Think of it. For the sake of that one woman, he walked towards Samaria, even at the cost of his reputation and life. And even if you were the only person in the world, he would still come down and die for you. And then we see he goes to the well of Jacob and there he meets this woman and he strikes her conversation with her because Jesus was the master evangelist. He just really knew how to draw people out, you know, to, to talk to them, to evangelize them. And so here, this woman is there and Jesus looks at her and says, give me a drink. And she's like, by his features, recognized him to be a Jew. 
And he said, how come he's asking me for a drink? And uh, because she never saw him as the son of God. She looked at him as a thirsty pilgrim, not the one who had come to quench the world's thirst. She looked at him as a tired traveler, not the one who had come to give rest to weary souls. She looked at him as a Jew, not as a son of God. And so she says, how come you're asking me? And uh, Jesus said, give me a drink. And she said, I have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. And Jesus said, if you only would know, I would give you living water. And then Jesus, I mean, you know, she was, Jesus was trying to penetrate. Jesus could see deep inside her, all the pain, all the stuff that she's been, you know, uh, collecting down there in the con unconscious and subconscious mind. And Jesus was wanting to heal her. He was trying to draw, he was trying to draw her out, but she was setting up smoke screens, you know, and trying to be very religious, discussing religious matters. And Jesus said, go call. And so Jesus had to finally hit the nail on the head. He said, go call your husband. And she said, I have no husband. And she said, I know you have no husband. And at the moment you're living with your boyfriend, I know it. Like she's quite taken aback. How can this man know about my sexual life? And you see the human heart is like a reservoir. On the surface, the water is nice and shimmering, but deep down is the mud, the clay and all the ugly stuff. And Jesus wants to reach down there today. And he wants to touch, he wants to, he wants to draw you out of the mess that you are in. And you see what happened to this woman. I believe this woman was totally healed. You know, I was once asking Jesus, asking the Holy Spirit, why so much space attached to this one incident? John could have added two more miracles which would edify the people. But Jesus, but the Holy Spirit said, Jesus wants to deal with the issues today that he dealt with then. And what kind of issues? What kind of issues this woman had? First of all, you see, she had gone to Sikka to collect water. I mean, there, there were wells at, in her village, but why did she go so far? Probably only one reason. The people in the village got to know of her reputation and they totally rejected her. They said, don't contaminate the waters of our well. Please, we have children here. We are of a respectable character. So you please go away, go to another village and collect water. So I believe broken with rejection, she goes to another village. And the Bible says she goes around noon time. You know, those ladies would usually go to collect water in the cool of the evening because that's where all matchmaking was done, you know. And this woman, I believe, carried the wound of shame in her because she goes in the afternoon knowing that there is nobody who's going to meet her. And people with a shame-based nature will never want to look people in the face. They're always looking down saying, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. So you see her, I believe she was suffering from shame, she was suffering from rejection, and I bet, and I bet guilt. Because five husbands, you know, you know what it felt like. And Jesus goes her to this woman whom society rejected. He goes to her. I mean, he wants to touch her life. And I said, Jesus, why did you go to the well? I believe he went for one reason, to present himself as a heavenly bridegroom. I'm your husband. Why do you look for love in men? They only will use you, abuse you, and reject you. I am your heavenly bridegroom. Give your life to me. And I will make something beautiful of you. And I just believe that this woman opened her heart out to him because we say, we see here that she left her water jar and she went back to the village to the same folk that rejected her. And now she's going as an evangelist telling them, come and see, come and see, look what Jesus has done for me. And so you see, she left her water jar, something that was so precious to her. And I believe today we are going to leave all that is precious to us. Maybe it could be the pain. Your pain could be the idol you're worshiping. And so you're going to leave all that behind and you're going to go out and tell the world, my beloved, look, I have met him. I've met my heavenly bridegroom. He's touched my life. You come and you meet him too. And so you see, this woman was totally healed. Now she had this wound of rejection. She had this wound of shame. She was guilty. And Jesus wants to deal with the same issues today. So let's take rejection. Now being rejected is going to happen to all of us but being controlled by that rejection could destroy you. So it's very important that you develop a very healthy attitude towards rejection. Like I said yesterday, you could receive that wound of rejection from the time you were conceived, the nine months in your mother's womb, because that baby in the womb is very sensitive to emotions like love, hate, and all of that. So you could see the wound of rejection could be inflicted at that time, the birth, infancy, childhood, and adulthood. Now Mark 3, 27 says, but no one, can enter a strong man's house 
plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. And then indeed the house can be plundered. So unless we attack the root of rejection, we will never be able to enjoy the abundant life that Jesus came to give. And so now we are going to allow Jesus to deal with the wound of rejection. We should never let this wound fester. You see people again and again, you see playing the same record. You know why I'm like this? Because my father rejected me, my mother rejected me. The record, that record is, keep play, is going on playing for the last 20 years. It's time you stop playing the record. You know this healing, you know Jesus, and go ahead and get your healing and live a victorious life. Now you see the dangers of rejection, why we need to be, rejected, uh, to be healed of rejection, because a person who has a root of rejection in his life will never, never be able to live an abundant life. Because you see, rejection leads to loneliness. Lonely leads, leads, leads to self-pity. Self-pity leads to misery. Misery leads to depression. Depression leads, leads to despair or hopelessness. And then it leads to death or suicide. You hear people saying, what's the use of living? This is a very dangerous thing to speak because you invite the spirit of death to come and actually harm you. So many suicide cases you see among the youth. The root cause is rejection. What? What's worse is that if the person has received the wound of rejection, that person who has never received love will never be able to give love. And so when the woman gets married and she has a daughter, she'll never be able to love her daughter. Her daughter has not received love now, so her daughter will never be able to love her child and that child will never be able to love that child. And so this will go down, it's passed on from one generation to another. And at some time, this must be stopped. And you also see people with rejection they have certain characteristics, like for example, they are people pleasers. Because a person with a wound of rejection believes that they are loved conditionally. And so they feel they have to earn love. So even if love is freely given to them, they cannot receive it because they have done nothing to earn it. So they are afraid that if they do not please people, people will withdraw their love from them and they will reject them and abandon them. So you walk around with different masks according to the group you're walking in, and you're putting this mask on because you're trying to be what people want you to be instead of being who you are. So that's one way. Then you will always find your worth in what people say and talk about you. You see, because um, you, you don't feel that self-worth. You're not worth loving. I remember meeting a, man, a guy and I'm just asking him, can you introduce yourself? And he said, oh, you know what? I am a person who has so much of property and I possess so many houses and uh, these are the uh, government authorities I know. And I was just looking at him because I guessed he never knew he was lovable by himself. He was trying to prove his self-worth by the things he possessed. He could never, never find his identity in who he was, but in what he possessed. So what's your identity? Get it right now. Your identity, you are a child of God. You are who you are, not what you do or not what you possess. Then also people who have this wound of rejection, they will always try to imitate others. They will stop being themselves. They will try to imi imitate people who are popular and admired by others. And sometimes you do it subconsciously, sometimes you will um, do it consciously because you suddenly discover flaws in your personality. You begin to see flaws in your personality and you will begin to reject yourself because you feel that you have flaws. I have seen people who have rejected themselves. They cut themselves. They burn themselves sometimes. They pull their hair and all sorts of things. And that's why Jesus wants to heal us of this wound of rejection. Then a person who has a root of rejection in his life will never be able to enjoy a healthy life. Because you constantly want to be complimented about everything you do. Otherwise, you feel unloved, you feel rejected. And you become very demanding. And you want to have your way about everything. You want to be the center of attention, you know. And uh, because all the time, what is your focus? Me, me, me. And when somebody mistreats you or neglects you or walks by without saying hi or bye or does not, does not invite you to a party, all of a sudden, the spirit of rejection begins to pop its ugly head and you begin to start playing the blame game. You start blaming others and little by little, what will you do? You will cut people out of your lives who made you feel depressed, rejected. And so you begin to feel lonely. So these, it, it's, so, it's so important, friends, because people who are rejected, usually their characteristics are very, very strange. You see, they, they live in denial. Even if you say something to them, a healthy correction, they can't take it. They crumble at any criticism. They are already crippled on the inside by the spirit of rejection. So they interpret correction as rejection. 
they interpret anything you don't like about them as rejection. So, you know, it's so difficult to walk with this. It's like treading on eggshells. I mean, how can that marriage survive? How can they have a healthy marriage? How can they have healthy relationships when they have this kind of attitude? And uh, so the Lord wants to now heal this wound of rejection. What is he trying to say in Ephesians one, uh, chapter 1, verses 4? He chose us before the foundation of the world. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ. Can you fathom this? Even before the world began, he chose you, he loved you, he knew you. He wanted you, so you are not a mistake. You came from the heart of God. You are his son, you are his daughter, you are a member of the best family in the universe, and God has no second-class kids. He's never too busy for us, and he's sad when we stay away from him for too long. You know to what lengths he has gone to show us his love? See the Garden of Gethsemane? Look at the cross of Calvary. And, uh, and so I want to tell you, my beloved, no matter what people say, no matter what they say to you, and don't feel rejected, you may make many mistakes, but remember, you are not a mistake. You may have failed many times, but you are not a failure. You are who your father says you are. You know, you need to look yourself in the mirror and say, who is my father? I'm the beloved of my father. Who is my daddy? He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's the architect of the universe. He's the one who flung the stars against the velvet of the night and he calls them by name. He's the one who was there in Daniel's den and shut the mouth of the lions. He was there as a fourth man in the fiery furnace. He was the one who parted the Red Sea. He was the one who uh, brought the walls of Jericho down. He said, and I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never forget you. This is your daddy. And he says, you are the apple of my eye. You are his beloved and son and daughter who is well pleased. And remember, feel loved, my beloved. Feel accepted. You are royalty and the royal blood of heaven is flowing in your veins. You're not an ordinary person. You belong to heaven. You are a citizen of heaven. And so we need to today to open our hearts to Jesus and be healed of this wound of rejection. Now you all see this 100 rupee note, yeah? You can see this 100 rupee note. What's the value of this note? It is 100 rupees. It is, um, let's say it just came off the printing press and its value has been established by its creator as 100 rupees. Let's say it goes from a printing press to a drug deal. And then it goes from the drug dealer to a prostitute. And then from the prostitute, it goes to a business deal that's crooked and wrong. And let's say from there, it goes to a hotel room where there is immorality happening. And somehow at the end, after all that, it ends in Father Anthony's hands. And I have a question for you. When Father Anthony looks at this note, he opens it up. What's the value of this note? It's still 100 rupees. It doesn't matter where it came from and what it went through. Its creator says it's still worth 100 rupees. And I'm here to tell you, God, your creator says, I've seen everything you've been through, every failure, every mess up, everything you've done, I've seen, but your value has not changed. I still love you. You are called, you are selected, you are chosen. Don't accept anything else. You are mine. You are so special to me. That's who you are. And now let's deal with guilt. You know, what is guilt? What is shame? This woman at the well, she had both these wounds. Now, guilt is dangerous, shame is dangerous because it drains you emotionally, it drains you physically. That's why the devil works overtime in this area. He knows guilt will keep you from your destiny. Guilt and shame are feelings. They originate in the mind. Guilt is how we feel about our actions and what we have done. Shame is how we feel about ourselves and who we are. So there's difference, you know. You feel bad about what you've done, and shame is you feel ashamed of who you are. Guilt says, I did a bad thing, but as shame says, I am a bad person. So when we feel guilt in our minds, if you feel, when you feel guilt or shame, see the body reacts to what the mind thinks. So you wonder why you have anxiety, stomach problems, sleeping disorder, irritability, and sorrow. You may think this is a sickness, but it's a symptom of a deep emotional problem. Even shame can cause anger, withdrawal, low self-esteem, all of this. You know, there was this girl whom we were visiting once, very, very sick. The doctors just couldn't diagnose. So we just went to pray. And when praying, suddenly a voice came out and says, why did you do this to me? Am I so bad? Why did you do this to me? And she was deteriorating in health. And so later on, when she came for counseling, 
she shared as how she was molested in a public transport. And that got her thinking that why did this man do it to me? There were so many other people in the bus. Maybe something is wrong with me. So this kind of guilt you could say is false guilt. She had to carry a guilt that did not belong to her. So if you have a guilt of being abused, raped, molested, taken advantage of, you have been touched inappropriately and you still carry the guilt today, God wants you to know today that you are carrying a guilt that does not belong to you. It's not your fault and he wants you to be free. Probably you're feeling guilty because it's your fault. So that's false guilt, but now you're really feeling guilty because you've done something wrong. You've watched pornography, you've committed adultery, sexual immorality. Jesus still provides a way for you to be free today. You have to invite Jesus and with blood flowing from his nail pierced hand, ask him to wash all that guilt away. Now, even shame, if you read Genesis 1, up to 1 to 13, like you see, where did guilt show up in the first place? It says, then the eyes, you know, Adam and Eve, they sinned, they ate the apple. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of, the, of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So you see, what does guilt cause you to do? First of all, they covered themselves with fig leaves. Now, what are you covering yourself with? What is your fig leaf? Is it a person? Is it a place? Are you overeating? Is that your fig leaf? They chose to cover themselves in shame. They chose rather than allowing God to cover them in righteousness because shame causes you to cover yourself. Shame causes you to run and hide. God says, Adam, where are you? People with a shame-based nature are always looking down. They can never look at people in the face. Today, God is calling you by name. Where are you? Don't run away. Don't, my beloved, don't run and hide. Like the woman who was bleeding for 12 years. I mean, she was treated as unclean. That's, that's so humiliating. She kind of slowly goes and she touches the hem of his garment. And then she tries to run. She didn't want to make it public. It was shameful. It was humiliating. She was living in shame. So she tries to run. Our response to shame is exactly the same thing. You run to anything that will make you feel adequate. Some of you are very good Christians, so you will run to religious things to make up with some of the things that you did. You run to church, church activities. I'm going to read my Bible every day. You start to feel bad about yourself, so you run to the gym, to work, to the Netflix, to the podcast. You will run to anything that you will get your mind off that shame. And you may run, not only run away, you may run away from God. You may run away from friends because you're feeling shame. Now, shame can also lead to anger. You can act out in anger and you think, oh, I have an anger issue, but it's shame. We are so anxious. It's not because we struggle with anxiety. We struggle with shame. We run to addictions. It's not drugs or alcohol you're struggling with. Actually, actually you're struggling with shame. And the remedy is Jesus. And so Jesus said, who touched me? Peter said, there's a stampede here, Lord. What are you saying? Who touched me? And Jesus said, I felt power leaving me. He was... He was actually, what was Jesus trying? Why was he looking for her? He was trying to draw this woman out. I can imagine here, and Jesus knew that she was embarrassed. Jesus knew that she was trying to hide. And so this woman, she knew that the Lord was calling her. And so she finally said, I think I, I have to stop running. I've done running. I've done trying to hide. And she fell at his feet in front of the whole crowd. She admitted, she said, here, Lord, it is I who touched your cloak. And here's what's going on in my life. She laid it at the feet of Jesus. What she wanted was a healing. She got a healing, but she got something more than that. She got more than a healing. She got a relationship, an intimate relationship with the Lord. And so my beloved, she now realized, and you got to realize that she was now the daughter of a king. So the remedy for our shame is to come to terms with reality. This woman came to terms with reality. She realized I cannot hide anymore. I got to bring it to Jesus. So the remedy for your shame is not keep running or hiding or covering. It's only going to fracture our lives if you do that. We need sometimes to go forward to, in, in order to go forward, you sometimes need to go backward. You got to go back and deal with all the shameful activities you are involved in, especially pornography and all your sexual activities that cause embarrassment. And that thought of going back and revisiting those activities can be really 
horrifying, but you've got to do it. And don't worry about what Jesus feels about it. He's never embarrassed. Because remember Hebrews 12 to verse two, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He did not despise the shame. He took it all for your sake and for my sake. And Isaiah 61 verse seven, because their shame was double and dishonor was proclaimed as their Lord, therefore they shall possess a double portion, everlasting joy shall be theirs. You know, shame in Romans 8 verse one, we have this. Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, guilt will accuse you. Shame will condemn you, but Jesus will convict you. He'll bring about a holy conviction where you will confess and you will forsake your sin. Like first John verse nine says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and he'll forgive our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. I just remember this beautiful testimony of this young girl. She had a problem. Uh, she would always, uh, she would sweat and that sweat would actually produce a very bad odor. It was really a bad stink. And she said, you know, my husband is going to abandon me. He's, he said, he's going to divorce me. I'm, I'm really tired. I don't know. I want to die. I want to commit suicide. And I asked her, I said, did you commit any sexual immoral sins in your past? And she said, yes, please don't tell anybody. She soon ran out. She closed the door, sat quiet in that room. I said, no, it's always confidential. I told her you can be assured. And she said, I had several affairs before marriage. And that I'm so ashamed of. I haven't told my husband anything. I said, did you go for confession? She says, yes, but uh, I cannot believe God can forgive me again. I cannot believe God can forgive me of such a big sin. Actually, you know, sometimes, um, you know what we think? We feel that we have to pay God for our mistakes by feeling guilty to show him that we are sorry. Like, you know, God, you have forgiven me, but I cannot forgive myself. I'm not saying that you should not feel sorry. Yes, there should be a conviction, but not condemnation. And so when you do something wrong, I'm not saying just do whatever you want and never feel bad about it. My point is once you ask for forgiveness, you don't have to feel ashamed or guilty. You don't have to pay God back. The price has already been paid. But when you live guilty, you are saying in effect, the sacrifice wasn't enough. I need to add something to it. Let me do my part by paying some kind of penalty for this wrong I have done. So this nurse, by not forgiving herself, was actually doing this. And she says, no, no, please. I believe God paid the price. I said, then believe that he's forgiven you and surrender the shame and guilt that you have. And she began praying. We asked Jesus to walk back into all those sexual incidents in her life. It's so important that you do that. Invite Jesus, be specific. Don't be embarrassed. He's seen it all. He knows it all. Invite Jesus into every room you have been in, into every sexual incident, the sexual talk, the sexual pictures that you watch, pornography. Invite Jesus there and imagine him with his nail pierced stand, blood flowing out, washing that memory. And so bit by bit, she did it all. And very beautifully, I believe the Lord healed her. Suddenly she screamed and she said, Hazel, I told you, close the door. Why did you open the room? I said, the room is closed. You know why? Even for a minute, I doubted because that whole room was filled with perfume. What a fragrance. And I just looked around and there was nobody. And then Jesus spoke and said, I am here. I've come with my heavenly fragrance. And there was such a beautiful perfume emitting out of her body, totally healed of guilt and of shame. So remember friends, in Romans 12, 10, the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses us day and night before our God. So if somebody's trying to remind you of your past, then it's not God, but it's the accuser who's trying to deceive you. He's trying to deceive you into carrying the heavy load of guilt. He will drag your yesterday's failures into today. He will tell you, you are too bad. You have made too many mistakes. You will never change. You have fallen too many times. You've made many resolutions. You've broken all of them. You will never get it right. You have an addiction. Keep giving into temptation. But listen to what God will tell you. You are amazing. You are my holy, righteous, blameless child. You are my son. You are my daughter. Now, whose voice are you going to listen to? Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the one who has promised you in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us? 
Are you going to believe the one who says in Isaiah 43, 25, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. I will not remember your sins anymore. Are you going to believe the one who says in 40, Isaiah 49, 15, can a woman forget a nursing child or have no compassion on the son of a womb? Even these may forget. I will not forget. I have carved you in the palm of my hands. Can you believe the one who's promised you in Isaiah 43, verse 4? Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I was once, you know, um, the Lord asked me to go through this um, through his passion. He said, I want to reveal to you something. And, uh, and I said, yes, Lord. And immediately he took my spirit into another realm. And there I saw the whole passion. I saw Pilate shouting, whom do you choose? Jesus of Nazareth or Barabbas? And I'm just looking at him and his eyes meet mine. And he looked and he said, I will die for you. Can you imagine? He will die for you. With gladness, I don't care what they are choosing, who they are choosing, they want Barabbas, go ahead, but I am happy to die for you. And then he took me to a next scene where they're giving him a cross. You know, what Mel Gibson shows in that movie is not much compared to actually with Jesus. There was flesh flowing out from the muscles flesh. I could not recognize, I said, Gee, is this a ghost? He said, it's me, it's me. I said, and look at the cross, how are you going to carry it? And he turned the cross and there were so many names written on that cross. He said, for them, I'll go ahead. And then he took me to the next, when he falls the first time, he, his face falls on that cross. He cannot get up, but he lifts his head, looks at the names, and he said, I have to go ahead. And he went ahead. And I remember that, that there were many things he revealed, but when they were nailing him, they were nailing bones. And I'm screaming, stop nailing him. Every organ in his body is dead. What are you nailing him? And Jesus looked at me and said, there's one organ that's not yet dead, Hazel. And then I said, what, Lord? And then the rib cage opened and his heart started beating. He said, tell my people, I love them. And that minute, I just immersed in that love, in that heart that he opened up. I was so consumed with that love. I just, it's not explainable. It's a love that is so, so deep, so wide. Like Paul says, I really wish you could know what's the depth, height, and breadth of this love. I know what Paul was trying to say, because if he only understood 10% of this love, guilt and shame and condemnation would never be in our lives. And after I came out of that experience, I said, Jesus, how am I going to reward you? I know I can't reward you in any way. How am I going to respond to this kind of love? And I said this one thing, I'm never ever going to let this death of yours go in vain. You paid for my sin. No guilt, no condemnation, no shame shall ever enter my life again. Yes, my beloved, my whole attitude towards sin changed so completely. You know, I do wrong. I make mistakes. Before I would beat myself up every time I made a mistake. But today, after experiencing the love, I don't have to beat myself for everything I do wrong. God sees your heart. He knows the effort you are making. I still make mistakes, but I don't condemn myself anymore because I keep focusing on that love for me. I repent. I go to confession once a fortnight and I begin to live victorious, without shame, without guilt, without condemnation. Because Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. It's perfect. It will go on forever. It never loses its validity. Never incomplete. By one sacrifice, Jesus made provision for every need of humankind. Every need of humanity is provided for by the death of Jesus on the cross. Every need of humanity for deliverance in the area of guilt, in the area of shame, in the area of condemnation, in the area of rejection, he has paid for it on the cross. Isaiah 50 says, I gave my back for those who tortured me. I gave my back. I did. I gave my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not face hide my face from shame and spitting. I gave my back willingly. I gave my cheeks, cheeks willingly because I had to go through the shame. They spat on me. They abused me, but I endured that shame, my children, because you may come out clean, healed of all rejection, pain, shame, guilt, whether it's in your in the womb or whether later. This is your Jesus, my beloved. This is him. And today we need to make decision. Don't be like Judas. Be like Peter. Just imagine Judas and Peter committed a sin on the same day. Denial and betrayal. Judas took that guilt and shame and went and hung himself. But Peter looked at Jesus. He never looked at his guilt and shame. He looked at Jesus who died for that guilt and shame. And look at what happened to Peter. He became the first pope. I can imagine Peter after denying, meeting Jesus for breakfast on the beach, eating fish and chips. He must have said, now Jesus is going to say, Peter, give me back the keys, okay? I've changed my mind about you. You denied me before a girl, a little girl, but he said, no. He's looking at them and said, children, you did not catch any fish. I said, children, don't call them children. Children is a family term. Children is a very intimate term. These guys abandon you. 
And yet look what Jesus says, children, have you got any fish? And I believe today, as we go into worship, he wants to have breakfast with you on the beach. And he wants to tell you, I know what you've gone through. I know what you've done. I know it all. But I've come to tell you, I've not changed my mind about you. I have, you were born with a purpose. There's a beautiful destiny I have in store for you. Maybe there were many things that happened in your life that you messed up with, but still I'm waiting. I'm waiting to fulfill that beautiful plan and purpose I have for you. Give yourself to me. Lay down all that guilt and shame. Let's have an intimate time today. Breakfast on the beach with fish and chips. Amen. Amen. Let's bow your head in prayer. Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for that amazing love. Thank you for that reckless love. Thank you for that crazy love. I don't know what you saw in us. I don't know what you saw in us, me. What you saw in me, Jesus. That you would want to die for me. Yes, Lord. Today I'm going to receive all of that love. All of that love I'm going to receive. I'm not going to miss out on any of it. So many years I rejected that love. I was hiding in shame and guilt. But today I know you love me in spite of all the mess ups in my life. Talk to him. He's calling out your name. Mary, Lisa, Joan, I love you. Please don't hide. I'll cover you with my robe of righteousness. You don't try to cover yourself. I'll cover you. Come. Come, give me that shame. All that guilt. All that rejection. Give it to me. I want to set you free. I want to make you into a new creation. I want to be intimate with you. I want to share my plans with you. I want to have breakfast with you. And I want to whisper those sweet nothings in your ears. I want to tell you how deep my love is for you. I've never ever stopped loving you, never. You thought I didn't love you. You were ashamed. You kept hiding from me and I kept searching for you till I found you today. You've come. Please don't go back the same, come. Come, let me hug you. Let me stroke your face. Let me stroke your hair. Let me hold you close to my bosom. Come daughter, come son. What is your answer going to be? Don't run away from him, run to him. For too long you've run away, run to him. Let him hug you. Let him tell you how proud he is of you. How excited he was the day you were born. All of heaven stood to attention, to rejoice at your birth. People may have said many things about you, but all of heaven loved you. And that was enough for all rejection to go. How excited they were when they saw you were a boy. How excited they were when they saw you were a girl. Because that's what they had planned for you. Yes, it was sad that your parents didn't love you enough. But look at what your heavenly parents are doing to you today. They want to lavish their love. Lavish. On you today. Receive all of it. Let it flow. Let it flow. Don't stop the love from flowing. Let his love surround you. Let him hold you close. Let him call you my baby. Let him call you my beloved. You've not heard somebody calling you so lovingly today. You heard it from the mouth of Jesus, your creator, the one who created you for himself. Father, If possible, let us kindly stand wherever we are and uh, we sing for rejoice and sorrows. And we clap our hands, we sing together as we give all glory to God for He is in charge of everything. He is going to transform us. And let us acknowledge.
knowledge that everything that happens in our life, He tends it for our good, for our joys and for our sorrows. Let us sing. Wherever you are, you can kindly stand and you can clap your hands and sing together as we claim it from the Lord. Along with the desire to give glory to the Lord, Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, we praise the Lord with you. Jesus, we love you, Lord. Oh, we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we praise you, Lord. Into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in today, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Let's give our heart into the Lord. Lord, you take over my heart and give me a heart of flesh. Remove the heart of stone. If you come inside my heart, it will become a heart of flesh, a new heart, a clean heart. I beg you, Lord, come. I welcome you with great love, with great passion, with great desire. Come into my heart. Keep your hands open wherever you are and sing together. Come into my heart. Into my heart. Come, Lord Jesus. Into my heart. Into my heart. into my body let's give everything that belongs to our body our shame our sorrow our fear feelings of depression insecurity feeling inferiority complex lord my body is defiled i'm lacking self-confidence i'm lacking that assurance of your presence come into my body i give you authority over my body i give you ownership of my body into your hands into my body into my body into my body come into my body lord jesus come in today come in today come into my body lord jesus my jesus i surrender my mind all my emotions in our wounds the feelings, the memory, the emotions, the unconscious, subconscious, and conscious mind. You remove those, those past painful memories. You remove those root causes of my shame, pain, fear, and rejection. Into my mind. Come, Lord Jesus. Into my mind. Oh, into my mind. Come into my mind, Lord Jesus. Let's feel God's presence is moving into your life. Somebody suffering from breast cancer, left side breast cancer. 
God is healing someone instantly as so you inviting the Lord into your body mind and heart somebody you have removed your uterus because you had cancer God is restoring health back to you and you will never have the side effects of that cancer treatment God is telling you somebody having a kind of a skin allergy it it, it affects all over your body and it's like a kind of a psoriasis and you have been seriously affected by it God is healing you from this somebody having severe spondylitis you are suffering from severe neck pain you cannot after you sleep for some time you cannot even turn your head left or right god is healing you from this somebody having severe uh, kind of infection this is like you have cough and cold it is always there with you god is healing you and recovering you from this somebody suffering from sinusitis is a kind of sinus god is healing you somebody having uh, vomited blood and you have some kind of infection and you are so much afraid God is healing you from this problem. Somebody having a kidney related problem, God is healing you. Somebody having a problem of uh, liver cirrhosis and you are struggling with this problem. You are an alcoholic. God is delivering you from alcoholism and from the sickness of certain things. God is calling Agatha by name. God is blessing her. God is calling Monica. God is calling Carl. C-A-R-L. Carl. God is calling you by name. He is blessing you. Matthew. God is blessing you. June. God is blessing you. Louis. God is blessing you. Jomi God is calling you by name he is blessing you SP God is calling you he is blessing you is hugging you your mighty daughter Jimmy God is blessing you Helen God is blessing you somebody your marriage is not taking place you're so much worried what will happen God himself is going to bring someone you have no one to help you to get married you are alone that that's your pain God is telling you are my daughter I will look after you God is calling Francis by name God is blessing him Millicent God is blessing you uh, Rince and God is blessing you Betty God is blessing you Saji God is blessing you Joy God is blessing you James God is blessing you uh, God is blessing you Hosea God is calling you by name Nelson God is blessing you God is asking someone to forgive a priest who hurt you you helped this priest so much but the priest is he has hurt you by the words God is asking you to forgive so that you will be blessed by God directly somebody who is a victim of war of tribal clash and genocide and you ran from your country and you still have a lot of fear God is delivering you from this fear as you pray for your nation this is Jeremiah 29:7 God is inspiring you to claim it for your nation and you'll be completely set free you and your children your family your generations from the spirit of fear and a kind of an indirect uh, feeling of revenge God is telling God is going to set you free somebody you met you witnessed the suicide of your brother since then you cannot sleep you have a lot of troubles you always have some kind of terrible uh, dreams and visions God is setting you free from that fear God wants you to pray for the soul of your brother who committed suicide somebody you are, you have been attacked by robbers you are attacked by thieves and since then you have too much of fear God is protecting you from this and God wants you to pray for all the thieves and robbers and those who have criminal tendencies especially the prisoners somebody your money was stolen uh, somebody the money was stolen and you have been falsely accused of taking the money that was being lost in a house you work God is telling you I know the truth and you will come clear just forgive those who made false accusation the same way jesus forgave those who falsely accused him for the sake of jesus whom you serve uh, somebody god is asking you why do you rely in totally on your authority your superiors people who are in uh, in charge of you they will hurt you they will break your heart if you depend upon them if you do whatever they tell you depend only on god there are some who have been deeply hurt by your superiors you stood for your superiors you helped them and in your need they just neglected you so god is telling you this is a warning don't uh, look at your superiors and uh, don't rely on them somebody you worked for your boss and your boss publicly abused you disowned you god wants you to forgive him mariam god is calling you by name cynthia god is blessing you blessing your family your relationships As sister molly god is blessing you is calling you by name romi or god is blessing you as somebody you are being so much frightened about your the neighborhood where you stay your neighbors are doing something you're so much afraid god wants you to surrender your neighborhood into the hands of the lord somebody that there was a dispute on the land and dispute on the trees dispute on the boundaries of your land with this there are a lot of crises in this god wants you to get out of it god wants you to forgive those people who are making accusations against you somebody who have deep pain of being raped a lady who is attending this retreat that pain is not getting out of you god is healing you god is healing you and doing something new in your life in accordance with this is prophet uh, hosea chapter 6 1 to 4 
God is giving a rape to victim. Hosea 6, 1 to 4 and saying, God himself becomes your protector and your provider. Lure the Sami, God is calling you by name, God is blessing you. Anna, God is blessing you. Martha, God is blessing you. Joel, God is blessing you. Priyanka, God is blessing you and your family. Cassia, God is, God is going to help you in your exams. That's what's coming. Calvin, God is blessing you. Violet, God is blessing you in your relationship with your husband. God is blessing Rosemary, God is reconciling you back to your husband. God is blessing Claire, Henry, God is blessing you, Clayton, God is blessing Daniel, a single mother who is so much been into pain because there is no one to take you to the hospital. God is healing you and miraculously. Uh, God free, God is blessing you. Uh, there are many mothers who are praying unceasingly for the conversion of their children. Today, God is giving your children the gift of obedience. Somebody who is affected by bird flu, God is healing you from this. God is calling Devasi by name, Paul by name, and blessing them. God is blessing Ezekiel and God is blessing him. Eva, God is blessing you and healing you. Selin, God is blessing you. Nora, God is blessing you. Dorcas, God is blessing you. Maureen, God is blessing you. God is blessing a Punjabi family who is attending this retreat. Uh, somebody you have extra marital relationship. More than, with, more than four women, you think nobody knows. You and your wife does not know. But the Lord is telling, I know it. Please kindly get out of wrong relationship. Please get out of wrong relationship. And that's the way your children will be blessed. They will be released. Uh, somebody you have initiated into a cult and now you know it is satanic. You have to come out of it. You don't know how to come out of it. God wants you to claim Isaiah 49, 24 and 25 with the memorare. And the Lord is going to release you from this cult, satanic cult in a community that you have joined. God is going to deliver you as you pray. Isaiah 49, 24, 25 with memorare. With the help of Mother Mary, you are claiming God's word. God is going to set you free. Somebody you are preparing for an exam several times you failed. God is assuring you of his protection as you claim Sirach chapter 11 verse 17. Sirach chapter 11 verse 17. God is going to help you. Somebody are being accused of being slow, being good for nothing, that you are not capable. You are being accused uh, by the by your manager that you are slow, you are not fit for this job. The Lord wants you to claim Sirach 11 12 and you will be lifted to the high. Sirach 11 12. Sirach chapter 11 verse 12. Those who have been falsely accused that you are slow and cannot do anything, God is going to help you. Uh, somebody, uh, some God is reminding you of an incident that took place on a rainy day, and it's an incident of deep pain that you have been accused and taken to a place. God is removing that incident from your heart. God is removing that fear that happened on that particular day of rain. Uh, somebody, you have uh, the, your friends have taken uh, money from you and. Now they are abusing you back when you are asking money. God wants you to forgive them, bless them and release them. God will open big ways before you. A wife is praying that for the conversion of her husband, just behave just the opposite of what she says. So she is in deep pain and asking so many questions. The Lord wants you to surrender him into the hands of the Lord. Tina, God is calling you by name, God is blessing you. Julia, God is blessing you. Frank, God is blessing you. Feel of God's presence. He is surrounding you with great love. Isn't he wonderful? Let's acknowledge God's greatness. Let's all kindly once again stand and in his presence and acknowledge he's wonderful. Isn't he wonderful? My dear sisters and brothers, we thank you for this day, for joining us, for praying for us. Tomorrow is the final day of our retreat. And uh, uh, basically tomorrow uh, we will have just one talk at the beginning. Then we will mainly focus on the inner healing service. So that means almost uh, one and a half hours. We will have prayers for healing from all the inner wounds from the moment of conception until today. So tomorrow we will set apart for the inner healing service. So make sure that you participate in tomorrow's service so it's so important. Then all those who need uh, counseling, uh, uh, now you can hear every now and then the cock is crowing. It is from my house, I am at home. so. It's a warning that we should not deny Jesus Christ. Uh, so he's again crying, so don't worry. Uh, and please pray for us and let us pray together now. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in the day of the battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do the openings of the heavenly host. For the divine power of God cast into hell Satan and all other evil spirits who wander throughout the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here. Ever this day be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, keep you safe, give you a good night. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. May God bless you. See you.
tomorrow.